right, thank you. So it's a real honor for me today to introduce Tracy Connor, who is currently faculty at, the, at Northwestern University and who graduated fairly recently in 2019 from University of Massachusetts Amherst, where she wrote a dissertation on clausal and predicate ellipsis in African-American English. She has robust research programs in both experimental syntax and sociolinguistics, which is a quite a potent combination. She is a genuine interdisciplinary linguist who is equally committed to theories and methodologies from formal and sociolinguistics, as well as sociology and psychology to address issues of linguistic injustice and inequity. She's interested in how theoretical descriptions of dialects of English can be extended to impact broader areas such as education, speech pathology, in which she obtained certification in 2010, and more broadly speaking, social justice for dialect speakers. Her latest research focuses on describing the linguistic properties of gaslighting using tools from semantics and pragmatics, as well as theories of language and power. And this is the topic of her presentation today. So please welcome Tracy Connor to our colloquium series. Thank you so much for being with us, Tracy. Uh, it's really a pleasure to have us in our midst. Thank you, Marlies, for that really uh, generous introduction. I am so excited to talk with you today about this newest strand of research and to um, really step into the mud here, um, testing my ability to do interdiscipl interdisciplinary work um, as I grapple with some new areas and some new data. Uh, I was so excited to meet many of you uh, today um, in uh, meetings, and so I, I look forward to interacting with more of you. Uh, just a quick check. Um, is everything visible? Yes, everything is visible. We still have the bars, but hopefully they're not going to get in the way uh, of the content. Absolutely. I'll try it one more time. Okay, what about now? Uh, no, there is something in the middle now. I do see that. Yeah. It's gone now, right? It's gone, okay. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm learning something. Thanks very much, Todd, uh, for your help and uh, the rest of the organizers. And again, I, I'm just so grateful to be here and be able to share this uh, research with you all. Um, so I want to start by telling you a little bit about who I am. I'm an interdisciplinary linguist. Who has troubles with um, technology? <laughs> but, um, and uh, I, I want you to keep this in the back of your mind for a little bit later on in the presentation. I want you to begin to think about your experience with gaslighting. Where did you hear the term? You know, what context and how might you define it? Um, have you experienced it? So I want you to keep that in the back of your mind. Um, so when it's time to respond, you'll, you'll be ready. So again, I'm an interdisciplinary linguist, but I'm also a certified speech language pathologist. And fun fact, I'm also a certified fitness instructor in many formats, as well as bar three. I always like to um, show that I'm a full human uh, and I always am so excited when other academics do that, uh, do the same. It really informs all the pieces of my life and full inform my research. So um, my primary research area, uh, especially in my dissertation, was experimental syntax, looking at African-American English and implications for education, speech pathology, looking at the structure of African-American English and Black culture. Um, and of course, today I'm talking about gaslighting, but the overarching uh, theme of my research is linguistic justice. And so it's al always I'm looking at an applied frame uh, for the work I'm doing, not only in um, with theoretical linguistics, with uh, theoretical syntax, with uh, experimentation, but even as we explore this new concept and the data that's associated. Uh, okay, uh, and if you're interested in my uh, ellipsis research, I will be presenting uh, on November 6th at an online webinar. Um, if you would like to, you can always email me for that information for the link. Um, another thing I like to share um, might be 
obvious, but I'm black. Okay, Black American, but uh, I say that jokingly, but really I want to define the Speech Act um, as one that is within that tradition, the African American tradition, which is a call and response tradition. So unfortunately, I can't see you all. I can see no one, um, but the chat is live. It's over here. Oh, I'm already seeing the hand claps. I'm already seeing people engaging in the chat, and that's the spirit that I want for this conversation that we are having um, as I'm presenting this work. So please do talk back to me. I might ask questions. Maybe I'll look over here and see your responses, but please uh, respond to questions. Respond with your um, thoughts or, or ooh, that's happened to me before. Um, and please put that all in the chat. Oh, this reminds me of this article that would always uh, be really useful for ongoing research and also to, to build on this community. I see the claps. I'm, I'm, I'm here for the claps. All right. So uh, without further ado, I want to talk to you about the origins of gaslighting. Um, maybe I'll, let me take a step back and just share a little bit about um, the why behind the research I do. So I talked a little bit about my research on African-American English experimental research um, in syntax. I worked in the Mississippi Delta to look at patterns of ellipsis licensing. Um, and that experimental research translates directly to speech pathology. It, it, seems, uh, it seems transparent, but it comes out of my experience. So when I was in uh, at Stanford as an undergraduate in linguistics, I study African American English, went on to study sociology um, with hopes of being a sociologist. But the challenge I realized for um, Black students, many were being overrepresented in special education classes. Um, I was seeing this in the literature, uh, special education classes because of the variety that they spoke. And so I decided to get my uh, master's in speech pathology as a means of. Um, being the kind of speech pathologist that could understand not only the patterns of African American English, but also the culture um, for the clients to provide better services, given the overwhelming majority um, of the clinicians are usually white in this field. Um, I worked as an SLP, a speech pathologist, for um, some time in Massachusetts, um, but I realized that I there wasn't as much uh, research on the structure of African American English to really even help the rest of my colleagues accurately diagnose and treat um, African American English speakers. So that's why I went back to school to get my PhD in linguistics and uh, looked at formal problems. So I, I say that to you just in case any of that strikes is a part of your, uh, your story, just in case um, the trajectory helps any of the students here. And I also say that to really characterize my research as always having a, a why, not just a what, but there's a why behind it. And so the same goes for gaslighting. This is an issue that is, you know, in the news right now, okay, this term, um, but it's also an issue, as I'll show later, that is affecting um, the way we can move forward in terms of social justice. So that's the why behind the what we're going to engage with here. So I want you to keep that in the back of your mind as we're looking at this data. All right, thanks for bearing with um, the, the monologue here, although I guess this whole thing is, but here we go. The origin of gaslighting. I first heard this term in, well, heard this term in 2016. Um, Facebook with its, you know, social media alchemy DJed this article to me from uh, Psychology Today. I had not heard of the term before that. Um, but the origin of the term uh, goes back um, to the 40s from this movie or initially a play, but um, recreated for the stage or for the film, a movie called The Gaslight. Now the term comes from something specific that happens in the movie um, where based on how houses were created in this era, um, anytime someone entered a different room and turned on the light, the gas, the lights that were, you know, me mechanized by gas, they would flicker or they would dim if there was usage in other parts of the house. And so that's how the movie Gaslight gets its name. In this movie, uh, the, um, the husband uh, is kind of, is using this house as a um, kind of like a treasure trove. So basically he's married this, um, this um, well-to-do woman and he's trying to find a treasure in the house He's always going to these different rooms. The gas lights are always flickering for this woman. However, um, he tells her that she's losing her mind. And so slowly but surely, 
um, this reality becomes more and more true to her as other people kind of mirror back to her uh, this negative reality. And so the gaslight is the term uh, that comes from this movie because of those flickerings. So I wanna give you an example here of uh, the type of manipulation that is shown in the movie. Okay, so thank you for all of the comments in the chat. Um, I know Dominique is saying that she she might wanna see it, but maybe the clip is enough, but I, I would really encourage people to watch it because as you see, the dynamic went from this playful manipulation and disregard of her feelings. And not only does he disregard the feelings, but says that she's crazy for feeling bad about the comment between him and the servant. But you see how far this manipulation goes and can you imagine this over days and days and weeks and months? And then also you notice that the servant is coming by and when, when he's saying these things about her sanity and that all um, contributes to the isolation and the contorting of this poor woman's reality. So I definitely encourage you to watch it because this topic is serious. It's, it's happening in relationships and families and you know systems, institutions. And um, so I hope people would, um, yeah, watch this movie and engage with it. So, um, so that was the origin of gaslighting and um, the term resurfaced um, in 2010 with the publication of this book, The Gaslight Effect. Um, and maybe more people are talking about gaslighting right now because of this era um, coming from the Trump presidency um, and this, these ideas of fake news, maybe that's why things are coming out, but also maybe um, people are more able to tell their stories given um, the internet. So um, now in the chat, uh, those ideas that you have bubbling, um, please do share your story. Um, have you heard the term? Uh, when did you first hear about it? What was the context? You can do that briefly. So the goal of my talk, uh, it's, it's two part. So first I want to uh, move toward a unifying definition of gaslighting. Um, I've looked at the literature, called the literature on psychology, sociology, um, and uh, done some research around other types of experts, um, psychologists, practitioners, um, and combining these definitions to come up with a unifying definition is one of the goals. And then also a unifying definition that takes into account linguistics, um, sociolinguistics and concepts of power. And then the second goal is to show you um, some things I'm identifying around what gaslighting is and how we can use linguistic tools to understand them and how maybe things that you are really adept in can be used to understand this really elusive uh, kind of phenomena. So I want to present to you this um, kind of working hypothesis that one of the salient characteristics of um, that's used, employed in gaslighting is what I will call QUD shift or uh, the shift of the question under discussion um, or called topic shift. And I'll use some uh, qualitative means to show you some examples of topic shift um, and in some uh, files that have been identified based on the definition um, we'll arrive at um, have been identified to contain gaslighting. So let's talk a little bit about the question under discussion. Um, Kupovelt suggests that this is really the bridge. The question under discussion is how we get from like sentences to discourse, how we get to meaning and it kind of mediates in between. Um, we can define it as a general approach to the analysis of discourse structure. Um, structural relations between sentences in a coherent discourse are understood in terms of relations between questions they answer and you know what, what's uh, at issue. Benz describes the question under discussion as one being characterized as how sentences fit into a general context. Um, under this understanding, each sentence is uh, in a discourse and it addresses an often implicit question under discussion. And that's the key word, especially for gaslighting. This implicit question under discussion um, can either be answered or maybe another question can be brought up to help answer that question under discussion. Um, and the linguistic form and the interpretation of the sentence in turn may depend on the actual question under discussion. So, you know, um, I, I can give you some examples moving forward. So um, 
what I define as QUD shift is really the experience of basically hiding the knife in plain sight. So this man was clearly manipulating this woman. However, we saw really extreme behavior. The, the coy joke he made um, with the servant that might seem playful and um, so it might go under, under um, we, we might not think that it has much weight, but imagine this happening over and over again. So I want to um, talk about this idea of QUD shift and how it also relies on relevant norms of societal power. So if he didn't have some sort of perceived power, either in the relationship or the dominant society, um, the effect of what was happening um, within that interaction, within that pair, uh, would not be as tangible. Um, this means that gaslighting can happen in any power differential, any relationship where there's that power differential. And then I want to suggest that um, gaslighting usually employs these uh, ling linguistic tools of politeness. Um, this is why I call it hiding the knife in plain sight. You're using language, you're accomplishing an end that is malicious potentially, um, but the use of language cleverly hides this malice. Um, one of the frameworks um, to think about this concept um, is within the framework of face work. Um, this is Goffman's seminal paper in 95, or 55, sorry, <laughs> uh, talks about this idea of face, how uh, uh, communication utterances are uh, conceived in a discourse and participants are on the hunt to um, preserve not only their face, but the other person's face for it to be co cooperative. So face is defined as the positive social value a person effectively claims for himself by the line others assume he has taken during a particular contact. Face is an image of self delineated in terms of approved social attributes, albeit an image that others may share um, as when a person makes a good showing for his or her profession or their profession, religion, uh, making a good showing for themselves. Um, so we see here um, invoked this, this power differential and align are the types of uh, roles available within certain interactions. So align is defined here as a pattern of verbal and nonverbal acts by which uh, a person expresses uh, their view of the situation and through this evaluation of participants, especially themselves. Regardless of whether a person intends to take a line, he will find that he has done so in effect. So you, you must take a line. Um, the other participants will assume that he has more or less willfully taken a stand so that if he is to deal with their response to him, he must take into consideration the impression they have possibly formed of him. So in the interaction, taking a line is a non-negotiable. Your goal is to take a line that resonates with you, but sometimes that is not the case. Um, here's an example from the literature um, about potential lines um, in this current um, world. So in 2013, Keisha Thomas wrote about uh, Black women in the workplace and said that um, participants reported that they could only take, they don't call it lines, they weren't um, invoking Goffman, but there were only a few roles or lines that they could take. So one was the pet where they're received and supported by their mentors, they're benefited and um, given support. Um, and the other one is a threat. Um, some women are finding, some Black women in, uh, were reporting that when they increase in their competence and competence, um, their mentors' attitudes and behaviors and support changed negatively. So this is an example of you know, the lack of lines that might be available based on um, kind of worldview of that kind of microcosm that they're functioning in. So uh, we've talked a little bit about QUD and this idea of shift, we'll see it a little bit more, but like, what does gaslighting do? A lot of people in the chat were saying, ew, gross, when this manipulation was happening and you feel it, but what, what is it doing in the interaction? And so I wanna invoke some kind of Surlian uh, communication around um, elocutionary force and maybe assuming that the elocutionary force of gaslighting is to get this other person to agree to a different reality. So we'll, we'll talk more about that as we talk about the definitions, but um, this is the seed that's being planted, that elocutionary force the force of the utterance, regardless of the form, is what's doing the work. And when we talk about elocutionary force, we can boil it down to, to five points. Um, the points of interactions could be things from asserting something, committing, 
um, attempting to uh, get someone to do something or to express an attitude or, or emotion. And um, we might consider gaslighting to be attempting to get someone to do something, which is to agree to a line that has been created by this other person. So we see this in the last clip. This line is that this woman is crazy, okay? And every utterance is uh, moving her to accept that line. Um, she fights back, but not for long. So um, let's play with this idea of QUD and just put it into practice. Um, what do you think? Put this in the chat. What do you think the QUD, the question under discussion is for something like a statement, Black Lives Matter? So clearly this uh, statement, this poster, it's in conversation, something. What might the QUD be? In the interest of time, I'll move forward. Ooh, ooh people are, are going, people are saying things. All right, all right, all right, very nice. Okay, good. Um, so say maybe it's, okay, maybe the question that's implicit in society is do black lives matter? Um, maybe um, there's extra stuff implicit in there. Or it's not looking so good because of the violence I'm seeing in America. So this would be an answer to the question under discussion, which is do black lives matter? Um, and so the illocutionary forces, you know, it's an agreement with, you know, uh, a belief. Uh, so the question becomes, okay, what, what does this do? What do other kinds of remarks function as? Well, does it answer the question under discussion? If the question is, do Black lives matter, then all lives matter does not necessarily engage with the question under discussion. Maybe this is why the contention uh, occurs between Black lives matter and all lives matter because of these um, implicit um, meetings and addressing different questions under discussion, or maybe an attempt to erase uh, a question under discussion that doesn't seem relevant. So um, some theories uh, that might be useful in continuing to look at gaslighting might be speech act theory, um, engaging with grace, um, and again, um, politeness language. And ultimately, I, I'm mentioning that QUD shift is some sort of form of an umbrella for the things that happen in gaslighting. Okay, and what I hope you take away from the talk today is that, you know, I'm, I'm a syntactician, I'm an experimentalist, I love clean data, I would just wish I could deal with the sentence because sentences don't get up and move off the page. But to understand gaslighting, we have to move above the sentence level, um, above the utterance, even discourse levels and look at even re realities, which means it's going to take a large team of people, it's going to take lots of different perspectives on language and on being. Okay, so one reason um, I really wanted to do this work was to preserve the integrity of the term. Um, I want to avoid semantic bleaching if possible and erasure of this term or even compl completion. So when, when I talk about semantic bleaching or erasure, I'm, I'm talking about what sometimes happens to words like, for instance, woke used to mean oh, somebody who's socially aware, but in some spheres woke means um, someone who's overly sensitive. And so uh, if we have a concrete definition of the word, then it can't get co-opted. Well, it's harder to co-opt. And so that's one reason I want to do this work now. Um, I, I love experiments, but I, I believe the time is now to do this and experiments are coming. Um, so one, one thing that's very interesting is that in, in some ways, gaslighting seems to be pervasive in certain um, more liberal or left-leaning um, spaces. However, um, there is confusion about what, what it is. And so you've got two people in an inter interaction or utterance or reality who are believing the other person is gaslighting themselves or gaslighting the other one. So who, to understand who's doing what, <laughs> we've got to define, we've got to define gaslighting. So there is no unified definition of gaslighting. Uh, one of the goals of the talk is to, or of the, um, this research is to have a really unified overarching definition so that when someone asks what gaslighting is, there's something to say that's very clear. So um, as I was using uh, these tools to identify um, a unifying definition, I had to think about a couple of things. You know, so who's actually talking about it and who do we consider expert? Is it only gonna be um, the literature and the literature for gaslighting is very small. Um, so where else can I get information? 
um, what is the lens through which the definition is focused? Is it the gas lighter or is it the person who is receiving it? And then also, um, you know, what kinds of linguistic things are going on are important to the definition. So I've looked at the literature in psychology and sociology where uh, most of the literature on gaslighting is. And then I've um, used uh, lay experts and I, you know, dare not call them lay because a lot of people have survived um, gaslighting or what people might call narcissistic abuse. And they um, definitely have um, exper expertise in talking about it, but then also practicing psychologists. So I'll give you a few of the definitions now so you can see um, the range of things that our people are talking about. So um, Port now is saying it's a mistrust of knowing um, an understudied phenomena of adulthood um, defined as individual's disbelief in or dismissal of the validity of their feelings. So this is, you know, person doing it to themselves, um, feelings and or interpretations of experiences. The phenomenon, this is, um, Abramson, the phenomenon that's come to be picked out uh, with that term is a form of emotional manipulation. So we go from a mistrust from the person to emo emotional manipulation, the actor, in which the gaslighter tries to consciously or not um, introduce, um, uh, induce in someone the sense that his or her or their reactions, perceptions, memories, and or beliefs are, are not just mistaken, but utterly without grounds. Okay, we've got more from um, someone who's becoming the expert, Dr. Romney. She is a professor in, um, I think it's, she's in uh, Southern California. Um, and she also has a YouTube presence. So um, it's having your emotions in reality denied, a form of emotional abuse. Um, if you are resonating or, or seeing any things that really pick, uh, stand out to you, please do comment. Um, it's understood as a type of identity related abuse. Um, it's psychological form of manipulation. So manipulation again, um, to try to contr uh, get control over you and to try to make you think that you are crazy. So there's the denial of reality and there's the crazy making. Oh, this one's beautiful. Gaslighting allows the narcissist or whoever to hold on to the pen as they write the narrative that, um, that, and they're the ones that are going to have the final say about what's really happening in life between them and you. Um, so those were some of the definitions from uh, YouTube, from uh, practitioners, psychologists, um, and here's one from sociology that is really poignant, and the seminal work for gaslighting, which came out in 2019, so you know what that means, <laughs> you know, uh, it's, it's been relatively a uh, new concept to get into journals. So Sweet says, I define gaslighting as a set of attempts to create a surreal social environment by making the other in an intimate relationship seem or feel crazy. I argue that gaslighting tactics become consequential when abusers mobilize macro level inequalities related to gender, sexuality, race, nationality, and class against the intimate other. By, conse uh, by consequential, I mean that such tactics damage the victim's sense of reality, autonomy, mobility, identity, and social support. I think this is really comprehensive in, in engaging with the power dynamic. And I would go beyond gender, sexuality, race, nationality to even micro level power uh, differentials uh, within relationships. So um, Sweet says that most of gaslighting research has been done in psychology, but Clearly you need sociology, you need those macro level constructs to be able to understand um, that this only works in these power laden relationships. And she mainly looked at um, intimate relationships and uh, domestic violence. So we see now that in looking for the definition, we had to have some different types of experts. We had to go outside of linguistics clearly, but also we had to go down to the level of the practitioner, which is something that's something that's been very apparent to me, even working as a speech pathologist, that my linguist head uh, would work on a, a project and be very energized by it. But then as a speech pathologist, I might realize, oh, it actually doesn't have very much real world um, application. Uh, so the practitioner working hand in hand as expert in some ways with the researcher, I think is um, critical for, I would say all research, but particularly in this investigation. Um, the lens that we've been seeing these definitions through is through family systems and intimate uh, relationships, not as much um, anything happening within the workforce, although if you're interested, there is a small bit of literature on what's called academic mobbing, uh, which relates to some forms of manipulation and gaslighting in academic spaces for tenure track faculty. Well, I guess for faculty, um, um, the research was done in, in the UK. 
Yeah. So all the definitions include this idea of reality. And um, so here's something I would offer up. Uh, I really think sweet hits the nail on the head, but I wanted to make sure the definition has this conscious or subconscious, which was also echo echoed in some of the other uh, definitions. So here's something, uh, a definition. <laughs> and please do feel free to comment or you know, write down any ways you might um, see improvements to this definition. Um, that would be really useful. So let's say gaslighting is a form of conscious or subconscious manipulation, whereby a speaker, a perceived higher status in a group, attempts to invalidate or deny the interlocutor's reality in an interaction or interactions. This has a global discredit, a discrediting fact at, uh, uh, effect at the macro or micro context. So there's a general working definition. And um, so let's take our knowledge of the QUD, our understanding of many forms of um, definitions for gaslighting. And let's look at some common gaslighting phrases. Uh, so I had a few meetings with folks today, some people by their faces, I could tell they've had some intimate experience with gaslighting um, and uh, many questions about, you know, what it is and, you know, what phrases um, are, are uh, characteristic. But some of them are, um, I never said that. Um, I talked with Ezra today, what about, I, I was only joking is how palpable that is. Um, you need help, the, that's um, a little more overt, you're overreacting, uh, that wasn't me, you're insecure and jealous, I only have these problems with you, you're being too sensitive, being a large one that was found in um, our small corpus of phrases. And you can go to the school link if you want to see uh, our more overarching list. Mm -hmm. And Dominique's asking about self-gaslighting and absolutely that's something that Dr. Romani uh, mentioned. She is a woman of color in the academy, of course, and she mentions a lot that as she studies this work, she, realized that she, she realizes that she does it herself. Imposter syndrome is uh, something that might be self-gaslighting. So great comment. Yeah. Oh, yeah, very nice, Rachel. Absolutely. Gaslighting is ripe ground for linguistic microaggressions. Absolutely. And it's just such, it's terrible, terrible thing that's happening, but also very beautiful data for linguists. So I'm glad that we can help. So we talked about the common phrases on the surface. Maybe these phrases don't appear that damaging, but the effects of gaslighting, uh, um, they require that frequent occurrence. So you see what was happening in, in the movie imagine over time, this would wear down your sense of reality, sense of self. Um, and then of course the conversation never pro progressed to any kind of goal. So um, it's a little bit like filibustering or maybe um, what people are calling on the, inter on the interwebs word salad as being used by quote narcissists or uh, people who use gaslighting as a tactic. Okay, so let's look at some data. Maybe I'll pause a little bit and take a peek at the chat. Um, I saw a hand was raised, it was probably 10 minutes ago, <laughs> but if someone has something pressing now, I'm happy to go oh, to participants. Okay. Um, are these, okay, go ahead and I might have you state your question. And then if I'm going to answer it later on, then I'm just going to move ahead in the presentation, but go ahead. I think Simran was the first one I saw. So sorry, I have nothing to add at this time. If you could come back to me, that would be great. Absolutely. Okay. Well, we'll trudge ahead. Um, if you can put some kind of emoji in the um, in the chat, if you've got something crucial, um, then yes and yes, um, I can address that. Okay. So here's a warning, y'all. We've got data, but the warning is that the data are qualitative. I know. I know. Feel some kind of way, right? Um, some of you are probably used to dealing with um, using qualitative data for your research. I know um, I've seen many in education, lots of different fields using qualitative data, sociology, it's important for us to understand things. But in linguistics, sometimes we like experiments, we like p-values and things like that. So this kind of went against, you know, the thing inside of me that really wanted to find a way to give y'all a p-value, but I have to say that data are qualitative and that's good. <laughs> we need that to be able to build the experiments. So 
without further ado, I just said that for myself. So, you know, um, here's the type of data uh, I've looked at. So we'll see some today. Uh, I think we have enough time yet for uh, film and media. Uh, we already looked at the common gaslighting phrases. Uh, we'll see some academic abuse um, in a, an email, a student email, and then a student interaction with an advisor. We'll see um, some data from transcripts. And I'll say this data was um, sourced as a convenience sample. Um, people heard I was studying about gaslighting and they found me. And I'm so grateful because we have really beautiful data um, that's a little bit more relevant to academic spaces. So here we go. Let's take a look at some clear gaslighting and please feel free to blow up the chat, the things you are seeing, especially with respect in this first clip to the, the question under discussion. What is the question under discussion? And notice the movement. So what's the question under discussion? Who is in the closet? <laughs> but what are the answers? you're crazy, you're always doing this, call your shrink, nothing to address that question um, unless uh, there was a different question under discussion. So such a beautiful thing. And we wouldn't know who was fooling us until we saw the evidence that there was actually a person. And so that's the challenge of gaslighting. Sometimes you, it must be proven to be identified as gaslighting, which is a challenge. All right, here's another one uh, more recent. Okay, so um, people really weren't thinking too much about this uh, clip in the news media, um, but now with Ellen kind of coming under fire of having a toxic work environment, this clip is resurfacing and it's getting a little bit more play. So some in the, in the comments are saying Dakota was not having any of that. And what it shows is a person who um, before was, uh, you know, accused of not inviting them, did their due diligence this time and was ready uh, linguistically to combat uh, what, what, um, what Ellen would throw. So here you see um, one example of the question under discussion shift is relating to um, who doesn't uh, want to be invited to a party. So I'll let you listen along with the transcript here and we'll talk a little about that. Belated birthday. When was your birthday? It was October 4th. October 4th. You turned 30. I did. And um, how was the party? I wasn't invited. Actually, no, that's not the truth. So I this time she invited. she firmly states that that's not the truth. Last year, no, last time I was on the show, last year, you gave me a bunch of about not inviting you, but I didn't even know you wanted to be invited. Well, so notice Ellen says, who doesn't want to be invited to a party? So the question under discussion is, did I, did Dakota invite Ellen to her party? And Ellen has brought the investigation out to who doesn't want to go to a party in general. And it's very fitting that Dakota says, I didn't even know you liked me. Um, invoking this in, um, implicit belief that you invite somebody to a party when you think they like you. <laughs> like I probably wouldn't invite Ellen to my party because I don't know, I don't know her and she seems very famous and why would she come? And so I think this is a great example of Dakota really staying clear and true to um, the question under discussion, um, which is defending the fact that she did a thing. Whereas Ellen throws everything. Um, uh, are you sure? She says, uh, I'm not seeing where it is. And how do you know? And so putting the burden of proof on Dakota, but luckily Dakota was ready. And she's like, ask your producers. Imagine if no one's in the room, this conversation doesn't go further, and, um, but um, she's, she's proven wrong. And then at the end, of course, oh, I guess I remember now. So it seems playful. I'm sure some of it was done for laughs, uh, but at the end of the day, imagine um, this in a workplace scenario where the reality of the powerful individual is not the reality of the, um, of the other interlocutor. And uh, to keep your job, what are you gonna do? Really beautiful, thank you, Ellen. <laughs> All right, so um, we've talked a little bit ag again about elocutionary point of gaslighting and we're really seeing that it's this constant uh, try to get someone to commit to this reality. 
Okay, so let's take it a little bit closer to home and look at uh, gaslighting and academic advising. Um, so here is an email, let me set it up. This is a, a student, um, an advisor. Um, the advisor has found out that the student uh, who has finished all, uh, finished all their funding, the student no longer, uh, no longer has funding and is now trying to teach a course. So the um, advisor has found this out and sends this email and says, hey, um, heard, heard it through the grapevine that you are approach, or applying to teach three courses, my advice, don't. Okay, so knowing the power differential, the illocutionary uh, force of the statement is different than, um, a, than a suggestion, right? So the student says, you know, I, you know, I, I definitely take your strong suggestion, but I need money to eat um, and stay in this program. Um, but the main thing is finances, the student says. Um, and then this is the reply of the advisor. Um, they say, given your circumstances, I really don't think you should teach any. Okay, so this is again, strongly worded and from um, an authority figure. I think you should devote yourself heart and soul to your dis, your dissertation. So this is uh, making sure that this person is working only on something that they um, control um, as the chair. Um, so they get to control the opinion of what's coming and going. Uh, if the person only does work on the dis, um, that you can move forward and apply for a real job. I realize you want to uh, get teaching on your CV. So notice the introduction of a new rationale for the student um, to uh, for teaching, whereas the student says it's financial, this, the, the shift comes here. Oh, it's for your CV and it's able to be uh, defeated. But I don't, uh, but don't forget that a major part of your application um, is letters of reference. So this is an uh, implication or invoking, it's, it's a, a veiled threat. Um, it says it would be very difficult to write a useful letter of recommendation for you at this juncture based on this. Um, so yeah painful, um, but polite language. I'm trying to help you. I, I want you to focus on what's most important, but also um, doing a lot of work given the power differential. All right, so, and then the um, professor follows up with, hey, I wanna do everything else in person. <laughs> so imagine the things that can go in person that are not documented, um, which is one of the challenges for gaslighting. All right, um, in the interest of time, I'll move ahead. Um, here is one more set of um, interactions between uh, an advisor and a student. Um, so the methods for evaluating this uh, was as follows. This was an audio um, recording and the date, again, the data were donated by the student. Um, the meeting was approximately an hour and a half. Um, it was transcribed using Otter transcription, online transcription, and then hand coded by my wonderful undergraduate assistant, Clea Went. Um, the clip, here's the summary, the student um, in previous interactions within this clip um, is asking for written feedback um, and in some previous emails and some other um, recorded uh, conversations, the student is also asking for written feedback um, from the advisor. So at nine minutes and 50 seconds, the student says, oh, um, Oh, you did read the draft that I printed for you um, afterwards or after some meeting, I think. The advisor says, yeah. And the student says, okay, uh, did you have feedback on that? I'd love to see it. Again, asking for this written feedback. And the advisor says, well, I mean, the draft doesn't matter anymore because uh, now we're looking at this new draft. Um, and so again, uh, a way to uh, not give feedback. Um, and then at about an hour, I'm sorry, an hour and 21 minutes, um, we get to another kind of culminating point um, the advisor says, oh, so hearing that the comments I'm giving you or have been giving you um, haven't been as helpful for you. And the student's like, no, that's not it. Um, but the advisor says, because they haven't been written and, and that it's only the written ones that are going to be helpful. Ah, oh, that's, that's good. I'm glad we discovered that. Uh, but it's, it's also kind of late in the game for that. So what this appears to be in this context is um, a time where the advisor just wants to help, like, okay, we, we just need to move the process forward. But in looking at the past transcripts and emails where the student consistently asks for written feedback, um, this, the true elocutionary force of this um, comes to light. Um, the, uh, the use of, I'm glad we discovered this, 
suggests that this is a new um, a new concept that the student wants feedback um, and wants written feedback. However, the use of discovered makes this more innocuous. And then also the use of this pronoun, we suggest that, oh, we both came to this conclusion together. So a clever use of language to commit um, the, the student to this reality. And then here's um, one more from this uh, student interaction with the advisor. So the, the um, advisor says, um, ultimately about the whole dissertation process, um, and the dissertation at present, this advisor says, I think the best strategy at this point would be, I don't wanna do this, but I think this is the only thing left. Try to remove as a requirement for um, a defense draft that it include an explanation for this contrast. So there's something um, that's being discussed and suggested to re be removed. It says, doing this means sort of that I'm going to try and make it so that you can defend something that I don't know will be fileable in the end. So in the chat, what is going on here? What, what is this advisor even saying? Oh, I'm loving the comments in the chat. This is beautiful, really generative. First of all, to even understand what is going on with this quote, you have to know something about um, the PhD process. You have to know something about institutions uh, you have to know that the chair is the one who gets to decide if something is fileable in the end, if, if you can actually complete your dissertation. So um, what the elocutionary force of this uh, utterance is, is to get the student to agree to defend something that might have them fail later um without saying this um and by using things hedging like sort of and i don't know and i really don't want to do this really removes any agency from the chair who has complete control over whether or not the student can move forward um based on uh what is what is written yeah the chair obviously knows what the student yeah and creating ambiguity very nice yeah Thank you so much for your comments in the chat. So unless you understand the nature of this relationship, the ongoing nature of the discourse between these two individuals, uh, the structure of universities and how dissertation committees are run, it's very hard to, um, it's very hard to interrogate these facts. So um, in the interest of time, I'll move forward through this, but um, in the question section, if you want, I can um, play a little bit of probably the most wild QUD shift I've seen in some years, <laughs> um, uh, this curious case of Derek Jackson, but um, let me move on to conclude at this time. Uh, so we've seen that uh, there hasn't been a unified definition of gaslighting and we're moving towards doing that, bringing our linguistic hats to, uh, to the table here. Um, and we see that this definition must include power, but it has to also include something about the linguistic structure. So within the general definition, I'm not sure if including QUD shift um, makes sense for the general population, but as we investigate um, this concept more in linguistics, uh, perhaps that should be a part of the definition. Um, future, future research, um, I hope to do more interviews with um, victims of gaslighting and of course experiments, but of course you can't experiment on something if you don't know what it is. So um, this is the groundwork for doing the later experimental work. Um, I can already see some perception experiments such as maybe having people identify um, instances of gaslighting versus uh, stating a different opinion or lying. I know Ezra and I talked about uh, dog whistles and sarcasm. So um, having people distinguish would be really lovely. Um, and here's some implications for this work. Um, so we've begun to define gaslighting. And now that we have some more understanding of the mechanisms, um, we can literally support victims of gaslighting and narcissistic abuse. They are among, among us. Maybe they are, maybe again, we're gaslighting ourselves and it's, it's us. Um, also, we can also not gaslight. It's hard to not do something if you don't know what it is. So um, I do want to make the um, statement that you don't have to be a narcissist to gaslight or even a bad person. 
we all have to really critically evaluate our language because it's just easy to do. So one of the YouTubers talked about intentional versus unintentional gaslighting. And they gave this great example of, you know, like a, uh, uh, an adult and a child and they're, you know, walking down the street, the kid skins their knee, they're three, let's say, and they're wailing, oh my gosh, it's the worst thing that's ever happened, blah, blah, blah. And the adult says, it doesn't hurt that bad or you're okay. I know I've said you're okay before, but really in the, in the realm of painful things that have happened to this small child, this is probably astronomical versus the realm of things that have happened to me. It's less so, but that kid's experience is that they're really experiencing an intense pain that maybe they've never experienced before. And it's just this subtle shift in, in language, which will teach the child to embrace their own emotions and their feelings. Um, and I'm sure there's other language we could use to help somebody through that pain. Um, another implication is that um, we can watch out for gaslighting and linguistics. Ooh. So that might look like thing, uh, words or phrases like, you know, saying something isn't linguistics, a type of research isn't linguistics. Um, questions of what is true data. That's not data. I, I told you I had to check myself. Like I was like, ooh, this is qualitative. There's no p-values in here. Qualitative data is great. Quantitative, we need everything. We need all of it. Um, and so there's that. And then who are the experts? Um, where do we go to find expertise, especially in issues where there's um, challenges with respect to power, right? You know, if the marginalized people keep staying marginalized, then um, we might not learn a lot about how systems of power are marginalizing. Um, so I think this is a really great tool to think about listening more deeply um, and then being willing to evaluate the data somebody brings to you, um, like open, open the closet or check with the, um, check with your producer who, you know, you were out of town or you get some outside support. Cause that is the only way that, uh, the protagonist in Gaslight is able to survive. So now, you know, the end, but you got to see the journey. All right. And then lastly, this has implications for diversity, equity, and inclusion, particularly retention of underrepresented students. Um, and I say that because uh, we might say that racism is gaslighting. And in fact, these people are literally saying this. Um, Dr. Frank Harris and Dr. Luke Wood um, are putting forth this new term race lighting. Um, and they say it refers to the process whereby people of color question their own thoughts and actions due to systemically delivered racialized messages that make them second guess their own lived experiences and racism. So it really has wide, uh, wide reaching implications for how we do academics. Um, so what I think should happen next besides the experiments is uh, forming a team, forming an A-team. And uh, I worked on a team similar um, to the one I have envisioned in my head at Stanford. Um, the vision comes from this project. So the Stanford All project was investigating the use of Quota Duvall. So, and I'm all, don't do that. Um, and it brought together uh, linguists from very different traditions. So we've got John Bover here and Isa Bushtaler, um, sociolinguists. We've got Arnold Zwicky, we've got Wausau, and we had a bunch of other people. So historical, sociolinguistic, um, linguists, syntacticians, semanticists, we had it all, all coming together to look at this one project. And I was really grateful as an undergraduate to get to um, be a part of this project. So maybe this is what we need for gaslighting, an, an A team that can um, look at the research, you can use methodologies um, from psychology and sociology, but also so, sociolinguistics and syntax, semantics, pragmatics, historical linguistics. Ezra reminded me that maybe philosophy would be uh, a good place to engage with these uh, questions. And um, please do put in the chat, who else uh, might be important for this team? And maybe it's you. So um, here on the side are the, the team of graduate students and undergrads that really supported this work. I'll get to them in the thank yous. So thank you to the Talking College Project First um, and the Fire Next Time Lab at UC Santa Barbara where these ideas were generating. Um, this lab was under Ann Charity Hudley and Mary Buckholtz. Uh, Jay Lynn Pittman is a graduate student at Stanford whose interests are in um, language and computational programming, AI and diversity. 
Um, and then also Clea Wendt, who is an undergrad at UC Santa Barbara in sociology. Um, uh, I wanna thank Sharice King uh, for supporting this work as well as the sociocult group at UC Santa Barbara who helped me really recognize that um, gaslighting was way more than the discourse, it's about realities. And so I wanna thank, uh, thank Lal Zeman for that um, point. And then I'd also just like to thank you for listening. Thank you so much for coming on a Friday afternoon um, to a Zoom room. I'm so grateful to see you and thank you so much to the organizers. And at this time, I'll take some questions. <laughs> thank you so much, Tracy. Can you hear me? I can. All right. Okay, so um, we can take any question that uh, you can post in the, on the Q&A or... Um, Loretta, can we unmute people on your end? Yeah, so uh, the colloquium committee is gonna do that. And so if you look at the pa participants panel, there's a couple of people with raised hands already. So you can call on them. Oops, okay, let's see, sorry. Okay. All right, I've got some volunteers for anthropologists. Thank you all so much. This chat is amazing. Can we make sure to save the chat? Yes. So sure. I, will, I will start with uh, Joy. Hi, can you all hear me? Sure can. I'm so okay. glad you could join us, Joy. Thank you, me too. I, um, I've been looking forward to your talk since we received the announcement that you'd be coming um, I guess I should preface my, my question um, by saying this is, a, this is a topic that's very near and dear to my heart. And I put in the chat, I said, this is the first time I've heard the term narcissistic abuse used in a linguistics talk, and I've been waiting for it. Um, it's something I had to get very educated on family of origin issues, relationship issues. It's usually something you find out about too late. <laughs> um, and, um, and, and so, yeah, this is, this is a big one. And I, I think a lot of us have, um, have at the very least indirect experience with it. Um, personally, I work on pragmatic markers. Um, so items, uh, I guess for English examples, like, well, so, you know, like, oh my God, et cetera. And something that's been kind of in my, my, my guilty research back pocket thought list um, has been wondering how these items are used in non-cooperative discourse. So in discourse, such as what we see with, um, with gaslighting. Um, and so if you, if that's a topic you're interested in, I would really like to discuss it. And I was wondering if you had any um, preliminary thoughts. I've really only been pulling from my own experiences. I'm a huge fan of the Romney videos. Um, so I, I was wondering if you'd notice anything with those kinds of items in particular. Absolutely. So thank you so much for bringing that up. And I would, I would love to learn more about um, the work that you're doing um, on these pragmatic markers. So what I'm noticing is some, some of these markers are used as hedges. And what I'm noticing, especially in that last uh, interaction between the graduate student and the um, advisor where we have the transcript and we have the audio, I'm noticing um, when the professor is talking about you know, concepts related to, you know, just the nuts and bolts of the dissertation, the language is, there aren't these pragmatic markers, there aren't hedges, the uh, professor is very clear, um, with few fillers even. However, when we get into these spaces uh, that look more manipulative, there's a definite increase of filler words, hedges, and I'm sure um, pragmatic markers. So um, knowing the specific ones you're interested in uh, would help me uh, see if I'm seeing a lot more of that in the data. Yeah, I had, um, I was looking at the examples you, sh you showed and I, I was noticing, um, well, and you know, have been ones that have been on my mind when it comes to gaslighting for a while. They, they usually indicate some sort of um, you know, break in discourse, but appealing to the other person's supposed shared knowledge about the, the topic at hand or, or the, the question <laughs> that's at issue at the time. And so I started to notice some tokens of those coming out in the examples you gave. I've heard it from my own, in my own narcissistic abuse experiences, using this, you know, as if I actually do understand right. and agree with um, what's being said. So those, those are some that just come to mind immediately, but I'm sure there are many more. And now that I think about it, the Ellen clip has 
um, you know, I liked you, uh-huh. <laughs> right? Um, and then uh, the reason I wanted to play the video alongside the transcript was because in the utterance, Dakota just pauses. It's, it's a healthy pregnant pause a good second or so. Um, and then Ellen comes right back in and says, I invited you to the show many times. And so this is her rationale for the knowing of the liking, whereas Dakota's lack of speaking speaks volumes, right? So yeah, thank you so much. I Hopefully we can uh, talk more about that. I'd love to hear. Definitely. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Joy. Um, I'm going to move on to uh, Dominic. Oh man, I've been calling you Dominique this whole time. I'm sorry. Oh no, it's it's Dominique. Um, oh, okay. But the uh, so this whole thing was like super super interesting, and I didn't realize like like I knew I'd be into it, but I didn't realize like how much I'd be into it. And I'm happy we're like over Zoom because I would not be able to have like this many conversations during your talk. Right. <laughs> um, I love otherwise, Zoom. but I was thinking um, because like I guess I don't. At least I don't really recognize um instances of like severe gaslighting in like personal relationships or within like academia but sometimes it's kind of like you get used to it and so it just kind of goes over your head but um I was thinking about maybe um how gaslighting works differently based on different contexts um so you talk about academia and you talk about relationships but um thinking about like in medical settings, particularly, and I guess like getting into intersectionality and all that, particularly for people with disabilities and then people of color with disabilities um, and uh, and how that all kind of plays out where it's very much like uh, you're imagining your pain or your pain isn't that bad, you don't have a disability. Um, and also mental health is a big one for that. Um, but I was also thinking about, um, and I don't remember if your like general definition had this aspect to it, but the earlier definitions that like, I know you didn't write, but the use of like making someone feel crazy um, is like, I think not great phrasing. Absolutely. Um, it, yeah, it's, it's, it's a bit, um, it's a bit ableist, but it also like distracts from the fact that gaslighting can invoke um, like other really strong emotions. So Lisa was asking about uh, in the chat was asking about the student and the uh, advisor situation. And I, I know a lot of people and like myself included uh, in like doctor's appointments and things when you're telling some, someone that something's wrong and then you recognize that they're not believing you and like maybe you don't recognize it specifically as gaslighting, but then you leave, which is like, you're just sometimes frustrated, sometimes you're really hurt, sometimes you're really sad. Um, so yeah, this is just like really cool. Um, and I guess I didn't have a question. I just had a really long-winded comment. I'm so um, glad you brought those other disparities up because really what what will it take to be believed? We see mm-hmm. Ellen and Dakota, like they're just having banter and you know there would be real contention about who is to be believed and imagine if your livelihood is based on someone who might have a certain character characterization of you already believing you. And how do you prove your pain level, you know, how do you prove something um, that you can't like quantify outside of yourself? Um, So I'm so glad that you brought those things up Um, and especially the language around crazy making. And then that's one thing I really wanted to move away from in the definition was the the, um, speaker making someone feel a certain way because, you know, I guess in, you know, counseling, they would say people can't make you feel the way, you know, people can act away and you can feel a way, which allows you to take responsibility over your own emotions. Um, So I wanted to take that kind of agency out of it. And so Mm -hmm. I'm glad that you brought that up um, because it it only works if um, there's this power differential. Thank you, Dominic. I I saw Cal's hand at at some point. Cal, yes, go ahead. Somebody mentioned prosody. I just wanted to shout that out. Oof, I've, I've done some work on WH questions in African American English, and I love prosody. It's so useful, but such a bear. But thank you for mentioning it. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Um, 
so at the end when you were asking about like who else fits into this like who else can do work on this I mainly work on computational linguistics and what came to mind for me at least was how I mean humans have a hard enough time identifying this but maybe we can get some help like mm-hmm. what would it take to train a neural network to identify gaslighting language. And so I guess my main question for you is where can I go to get data on this? Where could I go to get training sets? On gaslighting? Yeah. I mean, I would say YouTube. (laughs) Um, And I I would be happy to share um, uh, where appropriate shared data that I have. But yeah, there's, there's just not a corpus. Ooh, that sounds like a terrifying yet useful corpus to have, right, (laughs) of gaslighting phrases. This is one of the things we were trying to do in in our research was, you know, uh, gather not only definitions, but these phrases. Do you think the phrase level is enough? Are you interested in the, like, discourse level? I'm not, well, I'm not sure, because I don't know very much about, like, how running experiments on this will go, but I definitely, like, if nothing else would come out of this like new input on like really subtle ways people can gaslight something that might be useful at least like for me and I'm sure this goes for anybody who has been in relationships like this but having like an extension for emails or like texts Mm -hmm. that might pop up suddenly and go um I don't like this language this doesn't sound right to me would be like so good because it's so hard to remember sometimes and it's so emotionally based. So if you can have something that maybe is better at analyzing than you are, it can be helpful. I love that. I know I have that little tracker on my computer that says, hey, you know, you can use more formal language here. And so um, it would take uh, probably an understanding, a deep understanding of the like semantic mechanisms perhaps. that underlie certain phrases. I am not a computational linguist, but I love the idea. And I think you're right, that technology would be so useful for for all of us. And then it would be useful to victims to be like, oh, just like Facebook DJed that article to me in 2016 and maybe having some uh, mechanisms to help other people recognize what they're going through. Cause you're right, sometimes you're so deep in it. Uh, Participants have reported that, you know, it's kind of a, uh, what's it like a frog in the boiling water kind of scenario. So I, I would love to talk more with you about that. Please do keep me posted. Um, and I'll, um, yeah, if you send me an email, we can talk more about data. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you, Cal. I saw Iman earlier. Iman, do you still have uh, your question? I saw your hand goes on and off. All right. Okay, so I'll go for Danny. Hi, can you hear me? I sure can. Okay, Um, I I wanna echo that this has been so interesting and exciting to think about and relatable. Um, And um, in the chat, I think Promise asked, during the last question, something about like, how do you differentiate between between gaslighting and useful reframing? And so mm-hmm. I guess I wanted to boost that question. And I, alongside, I feel like when I've seen definitions of gaslighting in the past, and I don't think your working definition encompassed this, uh, I, I didn't screenshot it, unfortunately. So, I can go back to it. but I, I think in the when I've seen it in the past, it emphasized that there's this context of like a pattern of interactions. And I think you've also pattern. said yes, that's good. It's something about that, but I wasn't sure if it was in your definition. And so yeah. I guess I would just would ask like, <laughs> like what is the, um, when you're like forming your definition, like what's the difference between like an instance of, of a gaslighting event or something versus like the effects of gaslighting that accumulate or yeah. Um, yeah, I'm sorry if that, if that makes sense. No, that's really, it's perfect. It, it, it is a pattern of events. 
Um, is that the terminology you used, a pattern? I like that um, because it suggests that it's frequent. Um, but what, But the challenge around gaslighting, not around what you've added to the definition, the challenge around gaslighting is that um, the instances of gaslighting can come from different sources echoing the same thing. Um, so I wonder if that needs to be added as well, but yeah, definitely a pattern. So your question was, yeah, is there is there one, is there just like one instance, is that still gaslighting or is it the perpetual nature? Is, is that along the lines of your question? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I, I think that's really brilliant. A great way to bring up the uh, necessity to add this idea of this a pattern of interaction. Um, and then I, uh, I guess one of your question is, you know, is it gaslighting if it's just once, <laughs> right? Um, which um, I'm, I'm not sure what people would say, but I probably, um, but because that instance would probably be mirroring something within the macro micro context that is like salient in the discourse, if you will. So something like one person walking by and saying all lives matter or something like that. That's a discourse within itself that's in conversation with a bunch of other things. So um, yeah, I think I, I went down a little meta rabbit hole, but I hope I answered your question in saying that I, I do think there's something about gaslighting that is it's um, over time and perpetual. Um, and the definition should make note of that. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and and it's it's so complicated, but um, thanks for expanding on his thoughts. Yeah, thank you for bringing that up. And then this uh, the question of useful reframing. Um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, one thing off the top of my head, I'm thinking that would distinguish gaslighting from useful reframing is the reframe can be a way to get clarity, and then if the ref you know the reframe becomes like. The question under discussion is, um, is this what I understood or is this what you're trying to say? So is this the question under discussion? So, and then if the person says no, then a useful reframe would believe the no and there would be some kind of restart uh, and, and a coming together. I think it gets into gaslighting territory when the refrains never end and there's no, um, th there's no coming together or un unity. There's no shared reality. So thank you, Promise, for, for um, being diligent in the chat. Thank you. Uh, Iman is back. Awesome, thanks. Uh, uh, thank you so much for this wonderful talk. This actually opens up so many potential directions for research and analysis. Uh, and I really appreciate that. Uh, my question is mostly about the theoretical framework of analysis. I was wondering if, um, so more ethnographic methodology should be involved here, kind of within ethnomethodology or eth ethnography, or is it mostly conversational analysis that we only look at the conversation? Uh, and that's also, I think, related to the to the previous question because if it's going to be a pattern, then I guess we have to look at the broader context rather than just the linguistic context. And uh, I was wondering how that theoretical framework would fit into the analysis uh, within the framework of, uh, of your work. Okay, um, let me see if I understand. Uh, I'm. There's a question about um, methodologies that could be useful. So um, asking about whether uh, ethnography would be a useful tool versus just some more kind of conversational analysis, particularly due to the fact that uh, we noted that there's a, per, uh, a repeated um, repeated offenses or re repeated um, exposures to gaslighting um, that's important. So that's one thing. I think I'll ad address that and then I might have you reframe or rephrase the, um, the second part. But in thinking about ethnography, I think that would be beautiful a case a case study um, that would require someone to say hey I think I'm being gaslit and actually I think that would make for a really great research um, 
one thing that's nice in a discourse, um, if you have enough information is, um, for instance, the um, Bruce Willis and the man in the closet clip, you know, there's enough within that one minute interaction to, sh to show that this person is denying this person's reality and multiple times over um, a, a pattern of interactions. So one can extrapolate, a, again, from the, you know, the, the speech patterns of, of a person if this is consistent behavior, and then also by the effect on the uh, interlocutor, um, why is it at issue? Um, but I mean, ethnography would be beautiful, but um, I think that would probably be the most robust. Um, but in terms of identifying what exactly gaslighting is and maybe doing some modeling or experimentation, um, I'm, I'm seeing conversation analysis when we find these really clear examples um, to be useful. And the overall framework is ever expanding, right? Like what framework even is it? Because <laughs> we're in the realm of linguistics, okay? We're within a semantics, pragmatics, which I don't claim to like be an expert in. Um, I was just willing to take on this project, but um, we're in that realm, but in many other places, right? So um, if anything, I think the, the framework is malleable. It definitely has to take into consideration information from uh, psychologists. One of my goals is to um, sit down and meet with Dr. Romani and see where her clinical experience and her academic experience might be able to um, support um, or we might be able to come together. And so um, I'm really glad that you bring up like thinking critically about how uh, the theory can engage with the type of methodologies. And I think um, at present, the theory is ever expanding. So please let me know um, if if I addressed your question or, or feel free to um, re-ask re that portion if necessary. Thank you so much. Yes, you did. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. It really made me think. Um, but yeah, ethnography would be great, but boy, wouldn't that be painful? Like just spend a whole year with um, people being manipulated. And then at what point is it your responsibility to, not responsibility, but wouldn't you feel a responsibility to step in? That would be really challenging. Um, I wonder if it would be, I wonder how IRB would feel about that. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> uh, I guess on a smaller scale, uh, like even within indexicality and fencing. So for example, in that uh, student advisor context, if you have some information about, uh, let's say uh, the gender identity, uh, sexual orientation, ethnic identity of, of the student, that would possibly make uh, the analysis uh, different uh, in different contexts. Absolutely, yeah. And just to um, conceal the uh, identities of the individuals, I haven't included that here, but um, but you're right. It, it, it will completely change, um, not completely, but it would give more nuance. Do you have something in mind that would be, that would really shift the understanding of what's going on? Uh, one thing that I was uh, had in, in the back of my mind was, uh, so we had this conversation, I had a survey and then I had a term in the survey, uh, native speaker of English. Um, so um, I thought a lot about this when I was reading that interaction between a student and, and, and advisor. So being an L1 English speaker and even being of a certain uh, physical appearance uh, could certainly change that whole interaction. And I was wondering if in that analysis, are we going beyond the text, looking at uh, some indicators or uh, it, 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 so within the indexicality framework, something that would index beyond the text, uh, would we include that uh, in such an analysis? I, I definitely think that's useful, especially given the framework of power, because we'd have to establish that. but. Um, because of the student, because of the power dynamic within the academic setting, um, it seemed um, useful to be able to evaluate that language just because there's already a power dynamic. Um, are you thinking of some case where maybe the student would have more power than the advisor or um, just the implications of the varying identities being um, a part of the analysis? Uh, I guess the latter, so just being different, uh, different layers of identity being a factor, it's not necessarily a student having more power over the, uh, the advisor. 
Yeah, absolutely. It, it, it must be considered um, and in, in future research when I have more data, hopefully, um, and especially with this experimental work, we can uh, definitely manipulate those variables to see if that changes you know, people's perception. Awesome, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you for that. It's uh, 5.30, but I see Savoya's hand. So if it's okay, uh, Savoya, uh, can you ask your question, please? Yes. Um, hi. I was just wondering if you had any thoughts about um, the semantic uh, bleaching of gaslighting used to like weaponize the term. Um, yes, I have lots of thoughts. Um, can you, do you have a, a relevant example? Um, yes. Um, <laughs> I saw a Facebook argument um, about like paternity tests and um, the guy and the girl were like going back and forth and um, they were like, well, if there's a monogamous relationship, like, of course, the like the woman would be angry if you came out of nowhere with a paternity test. And the guy was like, no, that's gaslighting. Uh, ex OK, exactly. So this is the reason we need to do this research and fast, because it, this is it's a, a term like kind of like cancel culture like you can't cancel you know what does cancel mean like we're not interrogating these terms or I mean we probably are hopefully as linguists and researchers but you know the layperson is not necessarily interrogating this term especially gaslighting doesn't it doesn't even have a presence really within the literature um, a, a large presence so that's one of the reasons that it's time to do this work because you're absolutely right um, words mean what they mean to the person at the time they use them. So if we can at least establish um, something concrete now, then the person who, um, you know, on the other side can be like, okay, please explain how's that gaslighting and be ready to share how it's not. <laughs> I'm so glad you brought that up. Please do, if, um, uh, please send that to me. I have a couple that I've been um, finding on the, on the interwebs, but um, I think that's, uh, really shows how important it is to define this term now systematically, uniformly, and to help people understand um, the practice, not only so they don't do it to others, but so they can identify it when it might be done for themselves. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. And I would send it to you, but I think I blocked somebody. <laughs> uh oh, okay. No <laughs> screenshot. Okay. <laughs> thank you so much, Tracy. Thank you for the amazing talk and the amazing exchanges that ensued uh, between you uh, and the department. And um, so uh, we are coming to the end of the lecture uh, portion of your visit. And uh, now we are going to have a, a reception between now and six o'clock. Uh, I think that if people want to take five minutes uh, to uh, take a, a short break and come back and join us again, um, Loretta, I would be really uh, for keeping this link <laughs> for the reception, giving our, given our adventures with links today. What do you think? Is that possible? But then in this case, we wouldn't be able to see each other. Uh -huh. um, the other okay. would be a Zoom yeah. meeting. Yeah. yeah, exactly. All right. So should we, um, okay, so here is the plan. We are going to uh, try to get on that link that is on the schedule. And uh, Tracy, if you have problems uh, getting onto it, please send us a link and uh, I'll make sure to forward it to the department so that uh, we can have the reception. Is that so I, I think I was able to access that link before today. So it's, it's looking up. So it should be good. There. Wonderful. Great. All right. So I will see you in a few minutes. We can take five minutes and then rejoin. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.